chesed is found in our text, Deuteronomy 7, 9. Remember, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast chesed, love with those who love him. The reason God made a covenant with Israelites was so that he could show chesed to them, covenant love, loyalty, mercy, kindness, love to them. In other words, he doesn't mean like uh, just doing them a small favor. Can you give me a, a ride home after the service today? Uh, can I borrow 10 rubies? He doesn't mean like that. He doesn't even mean some kind of a feeling, you know, when I hear your name, I just, oh, I just, it doesn't mean anything like that. He means I have promised in blood that I will bless you. And I have made it my life's mission to make sure that you are blessed. And I will do everything within my power to see that you are always blessed. That's Hased. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. That's why God said to the nation of Israel in Exodus 23, 22, I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. They'll come out against you one way, but they'll flee before you seven ways. Why? Because you've got a covenant friend. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, we're talking about covenant. Abraham had a covenant. He was the friend of God. But what about us today? What about us? What do we have? Who are we? Let me read to you a very interesting scripture. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. Galatians 3, 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, or some translations say his seed. It does not say, quote, and to offsprings, unquote, referring to many, many persons, but referring to one, one person, and to your offspring, who is Christ. He's referring to the promises of the covenant. See, if you read verse 15, he's talking about once a covenant has been ratified, nobody adds to it or takes away from it. So when he says promises, he's not just talking about just any kind of promise that God made. He's talking about the covenant that God made to Abraham. And Paul, by the Holy Spirit, drops this bombshell on all of us. It's an astounding statement. He tells us God's covenant was made with Abraham and with Christ, who was of the lineage of Abraham. And, and it's a perpetual, perplexing thing to say. I mean, it, 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 uh, it, it seems like a contradiction. And I'm sure the Jews in Paul's day did not agree with this statement at all. So how can it be? In fact, even today, you know, many uh, Christians are scratching their head wondering, how can this be? Let me suggest this to you. If you study the book of Genesis carefully, you will notice that God actually made two covenants with Abraham. First, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, which we read to you already, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. But then, more than 13, years later in Genesis 17 verse 7. I know it's just a turn of a page in your Bible, but it's more than 13 years later. God said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Now, imagine that I marry Jepitoli and then 13 years later, marry her again. 
I mean, that would be peculiar, wouldn't it? I mean, you'd be scratching your head asking, what's going on here? Were you not really married the first time? Did you get a divorce we didn't know about? Why would you marry her again? Why would God do this again? Huh? And what God said in Genesis 17, I mean, it certainly seems to be clear that this is for all of Abraham's descendants, all of his natural lineage, not just Christ. Yet Paul tells us the covenant was made with Abraham and one other person, Jesus Christ. Go back to Genesis chapter 15, verse 17. Let's read this again. Genesis 15, 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. God caused a deep sleep to come on Abraham. He anesthetized him because he did not want him to participate in this ceremony. Instead, a fire pot and a flaming torch passed through the blood of those animal carcasses. You may disagree with me, and you certainly have every right to, but I believe on that day, God the Father made a covenant with his son, Jesus Christ. Think about this. For a covenant to be valid, both parties, both people must be willing. Uh, a man and a woman are not legally married unless they both willingly take the marriage vows. I mean, if we had a wedding here today and we asked her, do you take this man to be your husband? And she said, no, I'm really angry at him. Well, we have a problem. We can't just say, I now pronounce you husband and wife. We have a problem here, right? So they both have to be willing if they're going to be covenant partners, they both have to be willing. And Abraham had to be willing to do for God what God was willing to do for Abraham. Again, if we say to the husband, do you promise to love her, cherish her? And he says, yes. We say to the woman, do you promise to love him? And she says, not really. Well, then we have a problem, right? That's why God told Abraham, offer your son Isaac to me as a burnt offering because you have to be willing to do for me what I'm willing to do for you. But God stopped him. You just have to be willing. You just have to be willing. But no man could ever meet God's righteous requirements no man could ever be an equal partner with God. And that's why the Son of God became a man. And like Jonathan, the son of the king, Jesus stripped off his royal robe and was clothed with our humanity then further clothed with our sinfulness on the cross so that we could be adorned with his righteousness. And Galatians 3, 27, the Good News translation says this, you were baptized into union with Christ and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. A king could be identified by his clothing, a beggar by his too. We are identified as belonging to him because we have his life in us. It isn't the big Bible under your arm or the cross on your finger or around your neck that identifies you as belonging to him. It is his life in you. Hallelujah. Amen. And then... 
In verse 29, Galatians 3, 29, I'll read this from the New International Version. If you belong to Christ, does anybody belong to Christ in this place? If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Christ is the heir of the covenant. But when you received him, God the Father put you in Christ. He placed you in him. He baptized you into union with him so that you could share all of the blessings of the covenant. We, like Mephibosheth, were nothing, dead in our sins. But because of Hasid, covenant love, he gave us new life and he raised us up together with Christ and seated us with him at his own right hand. He restored all that was lost to us And he did not just merely forgive us, did not merely just bring us back to a place of being like we were before we sinned. Better than that, through Christ, we now reign as kings in life. How often we read Psalm 23, verse five says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Many times Christians quote that verse and they talk about heaven. Oh, one day it'll be glorious. We'll all be together in the kingdom. That verse is not talking about heaven, my friend, because you don't have any enemies in heaven. That verse is talking about earth. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Your enemies are in Demopur. They're not in heaven. Hallelujah. So that means right now in this life, God has a place for you at the king's table. Glory to God. Oh, I could preach another sermon right now. Uh, What's on the table? Everything that you need is on that table. There's forgiveness on the table. Hallelujah. There's blessing on the table. There's healing on the table. So if you're, if you're suffering with any sickness or any symptoms, you can just say, excuse me, please pass the healing. <laughs> it's on the table. Just reach for it. Hallelujah. You know, uh, sometimes in my family, when we got together, like maybe at Christmas time or some other holiday, we're all at a big table eating. You know, my, my children, my wife, my brother and his wife and that type of thing, my sister, you know. And so things are on the other side of the table. I want the butter over here, the bread's over here, the rice is over here. And so sometimes we would just say, we'd hold out our hand and say, thank you for the chicken, which means pass it to me. (laughs) Thank you for the butter. Thank you for the vegetables, right? So all you need to do is say, thank you for the healing. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for the strength. Hallelujah. Thank you for the wisdom. Thank you. It's on the table and you have a seat at the table. I think the church sometimes they're not taking their place at the table. That's their problem. They're they're out in the kitchen trying to make their own their own dinner. No, no. You need to come to the table, the king's table. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory to God. The Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter six, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Just like Jonathan the son of the king, he gave us his armor. He's saying, I have provided for you spiritual protection, everything you need against the adversary. And when we put on not just armor, the armor of God, it's his armor. We identify that we are in covenant with God just like David. In John chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus said to his disciples, those who believed in him, I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. I, I, Friends don't keep secrets from one another. You may not share these things with the general public, but to a real friend, there's things in your heart you would share. He said, I call you friends. Everything 
everything I heard from the Father, I've told it to you. That means there's nothing like, well, this would have really been helpful if you had known this. This would have really changed your life, but you know, <laughs> it's a secret. I'm not gonna tell you. There's some things I didn't share with you. Everything I've heard from the Father, I've made known to you. That means you need to understand and appreciate covenant before you can step into the place of revelation. He is my friend. And he wants to fellowship with us. He wants to be with us more than you want to be with him. Is that why in Revelation 3.20, the head of the church said to his church, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. We have intimacy with the Father. We have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ because of covenant because of covenant. Then in Luke chapter 22, verse 20, before he went to the cross, it says, Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. When we drink from that cup, just like Stanley we are showing that we are in covenant with God. Not through our blood, through his blood. Hallelujah. Amen. The natural descendants of Abraham, they received a mark in their flesh, which indicated they were in covenant with God as natural descendants of Abraham but God has circumcised our hearts. Think about this. Jesus raised from the dead with a glorified body can never die again. He defeated death. And yet he still has the marks of crucifixion in his body. Why? He still has the holes in his hand. He said to Thomas, put your finger in the hole in my hand. He still has the hole in his side. Why? That's the mark of the covenant. Throughout eternity, he will have that mark of the covenant. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. If the covenant depended on us, we would fail. That's why the Father made that covenant with his Son, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, this is my last verse this morning, it says, Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. He is the guarantor of a better covenant. Last year, my son in America bought a new car. I'm happy for him. And he had to borrow the money from the bank. He didn't have the money to buy it. But his credit score, you know, his, uh, his history of borrowing and paying back was uh, not sufficient for the bank to loan him the money. So I was the guarantor for the loan. So by signing, putting my name on the contract, I was saying, if he cannot make the payments, I will. If he doesn't have the money, then you have the right to take it from me, to demand it from my account. And of course, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Jesus, if you will, sign this contract, not with ink, with his own blood. And he's telling the father, if they can't make it, 
I'll do it. If they don't have what it takes, I'll provide it. Whatever is needed, if they don't have it in their account, it will come from me. I promise you, this will not fail. Hallelujah. So you and I today, we are covenant people because we are in union with Christ. We are heirs according to the promise. I want you to stand with me to your feet today. And I believe we should give God some praise and honor today because the Lord has honored us. I think it's right that we should honor him. Can you lift up your hands toward heaven? Can you lift up your voice and begin to give God praise today? Hallelujah. I think we ought to be thankful today. I think we ought to be joyful today. Hallelujah. I don't think we should be discouraged anymore. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Maybe your circumstances are not so good, but the covenant remains intact. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus.